Okay, and now we're talking about affirmative action bill. Now, there's a, a group of gender activists that have been pushing for it to be passed into law. It's taken quite a while, especially looking at the SDG Goal 5 that is advocating for equality between men and women in every sphere of life, whether it's uh, political, whether it is the public or private sector. We're asking that the same um, you know, attention that men get, women should also get that same attention. So we're looking at a 50-50 uh, equality between men and women. Now, when you look at the UN uh, mandatory uh, you know, um, limits for women participation in politics as well, it has put it at a 30% minimum threshold. In Ghana currently, when we look at the ministerial appointment, it is a little short of 20%. Now, for the members of parliament, female representation stands at 13.8%. And in the local governments, we have less than 7% of women represented our agenda and Abantu has been speaking and advocating for an enhanced conversation in order to pass the affirmative action bill and so I'll be speaking to two people who are advocating for this and they are joining me on zoom yeah. and so first of all Gloria Ofori Boedo is a lawyer and a lecturer at GIMPA and Vera Ado is the executive director uh, for Vera Ado and Gender activists so thank you and good morning so much for joining us gloria i'll start with you and i'd want you to break it down for us when we say affirmative action what is it and what does it seek to achieve affirmative action it's simply um some form of policy that exists to bridge a gap or to redress an imbalance and it can be a policy for so many reasons, for bridging a, a gap in education or bridging a gap in gender equality or bridging a gap in whatever policy in development so that those who do not have enough development, there'll be a policy to bridge the gap so that everyone will be at par. And you can find it's mentioned in our constitution under Article 17. Mm. But, but, but why is the target only for women? Because, again, the conversation has started. We're saying that we seem to be empowering the women more and we're forgetting about the males. And so eventually, we're also going to have that inequality where women will be at the top and now men will also start an equality movement as well. So why is the target uh, on female? Probably you didn't hear me. Yeah. You asked me the definition of mm -hmm. affirmative yeah. action. And I said it's a policy to redress an imbalance. For example, in Ghana, the, some years ago, especially after independence, there was a policy to redress the imbalance between the education of the North vis-a-vis -vis the Southern sector. And so we had affirmative action. Okay. By the to have free education for the Northern sector so that the, the level of education or the people who were educated from the Northern sector will be at par with the Southern sector. So okay. it's been used for education. It's also been used for gender equality. Okay, let, let me speak to Vera quickly. And I want to understand what the Abantu Project on Affirmative Action is about. Okay, so uh, Abantu, as a, a civil society organization, uh, works to ensure that we achieve gender equality. They've supported many women out there who, who on the ordinary would not have gotten opportunity to serve in a local government. So in that uh, just ended district assembly elections, Abantu uh, supported many women. We, mm. we actually built their capacity, giving them training and understanding of the district level side that they can also, when they are in the position, they cannot uh, compete or should be able to understand the whole person. So Abantu for some years now, have supported many young women, many women at the local level, at the community level to ensure that there's full participation of women and also to pass the affirmative. So you can't support the women to be there, but there's that legal backing. When there's a legal backing, then you know what you are doing is legal. And just as Gloria said, it's a constitutional mandate that mm. we need to ensure that this thing is achieved. There's that regional balance, but when it comes to gender balance, then we realize that there's that short fall there. So, Abantu seeks to ensure that we have that equal representation, both from the local level, at the regional level, mm. and at the national level, to ensure that we have that equal participation and representation of women in governance, in decision making, and okay. in development 
Now, I'm sure that as we're pushing for it to be passed into law, we're likening it to some other African countries that may have gotten the chance to pass it into law and they're benefiting from it. Yeah. Can you give me some examples of those? Yeah, I think that uh, for, for us as a West Africa, and um, we seem to see a lot of growing uh, interest from presidents across the country that are seeking to ensure it. We could cite examples of Rwanda. Mm. And if you look at Rwanda, and we all want to see what is happening there. And it's not just, it wasn't, it didn't just happen at, at a goal. They deliberately decided to ensure that there's a woman representation. South Africa has done it. And even just uh, Guinea, <laughs> they've, they've tried, the Equatorial Guinea have tried to ensure that they have the woman representation. So just across us, around us, countries that look up to us, mm are doing it because they're putting in deliberate measures and ensuring that women are the forefront. Women, especially even in Ghana, we are the majority in the world, we are the majority. And so if a population who are in the majority are exempted from development, then you think you realize that you are not doing the best. You, you can't exempt a majority from participation in governance and decision making and expect to develop. So countries around us in Rwanda, we, we can see how Rwanda is clean. And when we talk about cleaner city, we are going to talk about Rwanda. And we have discussed Rwanda so much about how they are putting systems in place and how their systems are working. We talk about, we can look at South Africa. Mm. Recently, I was in South Africa and I was amazed how they are also striving to be there. So. We, we can just look around what they have done and then also copy from them. They are learning from other things from us. So uh, the one thing that makes us different from them is that they have seen the, the root cause, which mm -hmm. is ensuring that there's a full participation of men in government. That's what they have done. And then we hope that we could also equally do the same thing. So I okay. guess that it's, it's important that as a country, as, as Ghana, and we say gateway to Africa, we are still lagging behind in uh, affirmative action and ensuring women participation. Okay. It's disgraceful. Yeah. L let, let me go back to Madame Gloria. And I know that we've been talking about affirmative action over and over and over again. I know that the Speaker of Parliament sometime in December 2019 uh, held a breakfast meeting to discuss the way forward. The President also has been promulgating uh, this agenda as well so we can pass it into law but looking at you know the the conversation and where we're going from how far do you think we've reached and what more can we do to make sure that it's passed into law oh, i i just think that um usually when it has to something has to do with women in public life there's that um tendency to downplay it so this affirmative action bill um for to promote gender equality you know has gone through phases. We've had the bill from 2015, then we had the similar bill 2017, then we had one 20, well, we had 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2019, and it's still not been passed. I think basically there's a need for policymakers and legislators to study the preamble to these bills, the memorandum, sorry, the memorandum, and find that it's talking about gender equality for national development. The fact that if we want to develop a nation, we have to find um, a role, an equal role or equal opportunities mm. for both genders to be active. So I guess if we, if we have that perceptive that it makes more of economic sense to get both men and women playing their equal role in public life, it will augur well for our national development. I think that's how it should be perceived. But invariably, it's associated with gender, with uh, gender equality, and there's that social cultural perception that is dealing with women, so it's irrelevant. And so that's why this bill has had a historic um, tendency since, uh, 20, I think it's, it's been revised about four or five times, mm. and that does augur well for our development. For example, in this... Um, COVID-19 era of the pandemic, we keep talking about social distancing, mm -hmm. social distancing, um, uh, hygienic protocols and what have you. How many women in the market have education or even understand social distancing? Or how has it been interpreted to them in their local language to appreciate the importance of social distancing and the fact that if we don't do that, it's one of the channels by which we can spread the and COVID-19. These are issues that shows that there must be equal opportunities 
for women and men, even in education, even in public life, even in public service, even in politics. Mm, and those okay. are the um, provisions which are incorporated in the bill. Okay, but I, I like that you talked about the effect it's having on women uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Are there any pointers worth noting that we must learn from in relation to uh, how it's affecting gender? I, I use the example of the market. Yeah, but I, what I'm asking is that moving ten. forward, because the conversation has started about how, especially even frontline health workers, more women, uh, you find them in the front line, and so you see that they also get affected. And so what are some of the things that we can learn from how it's affecting us? Yes, I'm, I'm going to say that I'm using the markers and the frontline women because at the end of the day, whatever happens does not affect women alone, but also food security and health of everybody, both men, women, and children. For example, food sold in the market is not eaten by women alone, even though the market sellers are dominated by women. And if it comes out hygienic, it affects the average household, which includes men, women, children, youth. So when it comes to the issue of COVID-19 and women, even though women play a dominant role in health, in um, food security, in food processing, food transportation, now everybody's alert mm. that it should be um, hygienic, it should be um, protective because it's going to affect everybody, including men, women, youth and households. So um, invariably, what affects women has has transpired to affect the whole society. Mm. Okay, let me go back to Vera and ask her. So in the wake of the pandemic as well, really what I want to understand is why there's a need for women's participation, um, you know, in decision-making processes all across. Yeah, so uh, take, taking it from what Gloria mentioned, you see, when we come to our various homes, women are the caregivers. They, they, they perform majority of the roles in the houses. And so if we are looking at the pandemic and how much it is affecting our household. Now we are asking practices, schools uh, are on holidays or they have to close down because our children have to be home. And who are taking care of these children? It is the parents. Even when the family is home, it is the mothers who have extra responsibility to ensure that children stay home, children are not going out, making sure that we are eating healthy. So you realize that the home, even the home management, the responsibility of the woman, it relies more on the woman to ensure that women or the children or the family are protected. They are staying indoors. They are eating healthy to boost their immune system, washing their hands. So taking it from the market, who are going to the market, who are providing food for the family, who are even cooking for the larger population. Look at, let's look at people selling for people. In as much as there's a lockdown, we ask that oh, those selling food can stay. Who are selling the food? It is the women. So if they don't understand the processes, and in terms of communication, who are doing the education? Who is even communicating the COVID messages to us? We realize that almost all the time we have a lot of men speaking to us. It is this: the president comes in, and then other men are telling us. So at the forefront of decision making, who are communicating to us to ensure that this woman, you know issues that are affecting us, even in their houses, even in the offices, they are participating in health care workers, they go mm. to their hospital, they come back home, and they have to still provide for their families. So what measures are they putting in place to ensure that aside my official duties as saving lives when I come home, mm -hmm. I have to also protect myself and save my family in their home as well. So when we talk about ensuring that women are part of all the processes, it's just to, for our own safety, mm -hmm. for our own protection, to ensure that our children in the various homes are protected. They are abiding by the rules and say no going out. We are eating healthy because the mother went to the market and to ensure that we have something to eat. So okay. when women understand the whole processes, the whole essence of safety and regulations in this whole space, mm. it means that it's in the larger uh, interest of the community to ensure that if I'm keeping my home safe, if I'm, my mother understands that I have to okay. uh, stay and eat well and not go out and play and also pass it on to the kids and then we ignore that the children have to also understand what is happening we don't we can't just leave them and say oh is that don't go to school why are we not going to school the children will ask questions why are you not going to school and Definitely. so the decision is to ensure that we pass on the information and who is even giving us information in the first place mm -hmm. the fourth from the government side we hear the information. So who, who is telling us who are making the key decision? And when these key decisions are 
involved by women and women are taking part of the decision making. You ensure that measures will come out and will not just be one sided. Measures coming out will factor the needs of women, the needs of young people, the needs of children. Because okay. they are thinking of they are thinking beyond themselves to think about their families, they think about right. the community and to also think about okay. the larger so it, All right. it's important we Thank you so much, Vera Addo, who is the executive director of Abantu, and also uh, Gloria Oforibwedu is a lawyer and a lecturer at Gimpa. Thank you for speaking to us on TV3 New Day. And we're keeping our fingers crossed, hoping that the second quarter will bring us some good news in relation uh, to affirmative action bills.